The largest rocket element NASA has ever built, the core stage of NASA's space launch system, fired its four RS-25 engines for 8 minutes and 19 seconds Thursday at NASA's Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. The successful test, known as a hot fire test, is a critical milestone ahead of the agency's Artemis 1 mission, which will send an uncrewed Orion spacecraft on a test flight around the moon and back to Earth. Engineers designed the eight-part green run test campaign to gradually bring the SLS core stage to life for the first time, culminating with the hot fire. NASA previously conducted a hot fire test of the SLS core stage on January 16. The four RS-25 engines fired together for the first time for about one minute before the test ended earlier than planned. Following data analysis, NASA determined a second and longer hot fire test would provide valuable data to help verify the core stage design for flight. During the second hot fire test, the stage fired the engines for a little more than eight minutes, just like it will during every Artemis launch to the moon. The longer duration hot fire tested a variety of operational conditions, including moving the four engines in specific patterns to direct thrust, powering the engines up to 109% of rated power, and throttling them down and back up. During this test, the team conducted new operations with the core stage for the first time, repeated some critical operations, and recorded test data that will help NASA verify the core stage is ready for SLS flights. Since the green run test campaign is now over, the core stage for SLS will be refurbished, then shipped to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. There the core stage will be assembled with the solid rocket boosters and NASA's Orion spacecraft in preparation for Artemis 1. The Falcon 9 launched another set of Starlink satellites on March 14, with the rocket's first stage setting a record with its ninth launch and landing. The upper stage deployed its payload of 60 Starlink satellites into orbit 65 minutes after liftoff, bringing the size of the broadband internet constellation to 1,260 satellites. The rocket's first stage landed on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean, eight and a half minutes after liftoff. The booster which powered this mission was used previously on a variety of missions, including five prior Starlink launches, as well as the Demo-1 mission for the company's Crew Dragon capsule. The launch was the eighth for the Falcon 9 this year and took place a little more than 72 hours after another Falcon 9 launch of Starlink satellites on March 11. A recent update from NASA reveals that NASA and SpaceX have signed a joint agreement to formalize both parties' strong interest in the sharing of information to maintain and improve space safety. The focus of the agreement is on conjunction avoidance and launch collision avoidance between NASA spacecraft and the large constellation of SpaceX Starlink satellites, as well as related rideshare missions. SpaceX has agreed its Starlink satellites will autonomously or manually maneuver to ensure NASA science satellites and other assets can operate uninterrupted from a collision avoidance perspective. Unless otherwise informed by SpaceX, NASA has agreed to not maneuver its assets in the event of a potential conjunction to ensure the parties do not inadvertently maneuver into one another. According to acting NASA Administrator Steve Jurchik, with commercial companies launching more and more satellites, it's critical NASA increase communications, exchange data, and establish best practices to ensure we all maintain a safe space environment. A new report suggests that the United States Air Force is considering Starlink Internet connectivity for its potential military applications. One of the major contractors to the United States Air Force, Ball Aerospace, is working with SpaceX to investigate if Starlink satellites might have military applications. The FCC document said that the tests were designed to demonstrate the ability to transmit and receive information from two stationary ground sites and an airborne aircraft, with limited testing from a moving vehicle on the ground. SpaceX also disclosed that it was working with Ball Aerospace, which will provide the antennas needed for connecting to Starlink satellites on military aircraft. The Air Force experiment will begin with ground testing near SpaceX's Starlink manufacturing facilities in Redmond, Washington. Then the test will move to Edwards Air Force Base in California for a ground-to-air scenario. Russian scientists launched one of the world's biggest underwater space telescopes to peer deep into the universe from the pristine waters of Lake Baikal. The Deep Underwater Telescope, which has been under construction since 2015, is designed to observe neutrinos, the smallest particles currently known. Neutrinos are the most abundant particles within the universe and could be the reason matter exists at all. Neutrinos are so plentiful that trillions of them pass through the human body every second. 
The particles are incredibly hard to capture because they travel almost at the speed of light. Although abundant, neutrinos are not absorbed by matter or deflected by magnetic fields, and they only interact with gravity and weak force. The Russian telescope, dubbed Baikal Gigatron Volume Detector, is submerged to a depth of 750 to 1,300 meters into the water. The telescope detects neutrinos through the Cherenkov experiment. Cherenkov radiation is a kind of electromagnetic radiation emitted when a charged particle passes through a dielectric medium at a speed greater than the phase velocity of light in that medium. Here, water acts as a detection medium and increases the chances that a neutrino will interact. When a lightning-fast neutrino hits the water, it creates an electron or muon in the water, which in turn emits Cherenkov radiation. The Baikal telescope has a cluster of eight strings of light-sensing equipment that consists of hundreds of spherical modules made of glass and stainless steel, connected to the surface through a set of cables. Each one of those modules are vertically spread out 49 feet from the other, and they currently occupy an area measuring 17,657 cubic feet. Over time, the plan is to add more sensors to make the telescope even bigger. Mars was once home to lakes and oceans, and where all the water went to transform the planet into the desolate rock we know today has been something of a mystery. Most of it was thought to have been lost to space, but a new study funded by NASA proposes that it didn't go anywhere but is trapped within minerals in the crust. The new study, published in the journal Science, shows that a significant portion of Mars water, between 30 and 99 percent, is trapped within minerals in the planet's crust. The study proposes that a combination of two mechanisms is responsible for the loss of water. According to the research team, the trapping of water in minerals in the planet's crust and the loss of water to the atmosphere can explain this mystery. The researchers said that when water interacts with rock, chemical weathering forms clays and other hydras minerals that contain water as part of their mineral structure. The researchers concluded that atmospheric escape had a role in water loss, but findings from the last decade of Mars missions have pointed to the fact that there was this huge reservoir of ancient hydrated minerals, whose formation certainly decreased water availability over time. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. On March 15, Starship SN11 momentarily ignited one or two of its three Raptor engines pre-burners that looked like a weak static fire and produced a small but visible amount of flame and thrust. SpaceX aborted the static fire test on that day and wasn't able to conduct another static fire test last week. SpaceX will now attempt a second static fire test on Monday, and if all goes according to the plan, we could see the high-altitude test flight of serial number 11 this week. A recent public notice of Cameron County ordered a temporary closure of State Highway 4 and Boca Chica Beach from March 22 to 25. The next static fire attempt and the test flight of SN11 could happen during these days. A comparison of the Starship launch operation timeline shows us that SpaceX has been gradually speeding up the test flight process over time. Starship SN10, the first prototype of its kind to land in one piece, took just 33 days to go from pad arrival to liftoff and spent just eight days between its first static fire and launch attempts. The same feats took Starship SN877 and 50 days respectively, with SN9 splitting the difference at 43 days from transport to liftoff and 28 days between its first static fire and launch attempts. If Starship SN11 does manage to launch within a few days of its static fire attempt on Monday, SpaceX would still crush SN10's 33-day record. Meanwhile, SpaceX recently rolled back the Starship test tank, serial number 7.2, from the test site to the build site. This 3mm test tank had undergone intentional pressurization to failure test on 4 February, developing a leak which was later repaired by SpaceX employees. On March 18, the Federal Aviation Administration released its findings from a public scoping report relating to SpaceX's Starship and Super Heavy launch proposal at Boca Chica. In the report, the FAA states it is conducting an environmental review of SpaceX's plans to launch its spacecraft from Boca Chica and will review whether or not it will approve the project. A public scoping period was held between December 2020 and January 2021 to review comments and concerns on the SpaceX project. The FAA received 321 responses during the survey, 122 of which came from agencies and non-governmental organizations. Some respondents raised concerns about the project's impact on local species and their habitat, 
impact on the land, negative impact on low-income residents in the area, and the overall degradation of the environment. However, others responded differently to the project and noted economic benefits regionally, job creation, and progress in commercial space transportation as positive impacts. The FAA will use these comments in a draft environmental assessment that will dictate how the agency responds to SpaceX's request to launch their spacecraft in Boca Chica. As part of the license application process to launch Starship, SpaceX must complete a safety review and develop agreements, in addition to the environmental review. Check out the link in the description to read the full report from the FAA. Now, let's discuss what's happening at the Starship build site. For the first time ever, SpaceX has stacked a super-heavy tank section to its full height, effectively completing the assembly of the largest rocket booster ever built. This was a first-of-its-kind occurrence, with a section of the high bay roof needing to be removed to allow the crane hook to descend through it. Although a considerable amount of work still remains to weld the two halves together and connect their pre-installed plumbing and avionics runs, those activities are mostly marginal. Comprised of 36 stainless steel rings, the booster BN-1 stands roughly 70 meters tall. With a Starship installed on top of the booster, the entire rocket will be 120 meters tall, making it the tallest launch vehicle ever assembled. According to SpaceX CEO Elon Musk, Super Heavy BN-1 will be a production pathfinder to figure out how to build and transport a 70-meter tall stage, also serving as a testbed for inaugural pressure and proof tests, as well as a possible Raptor static fire. According to him, Booster BN-2 will be the first Super Heavy prototype to fly from Boca Chica launch site, possibly with a mass simulator on top. He added that SpaceX hopes to be ready to begin orbital Starship launches as early as July 2021. The first launch attempt will nominally use Super Heavy Booster BN-3, with Starship serial number 20 installed atop. According to Musk, SpaceX is planning to use the launch tower to stack the Starship atop the booster. The launch tower should have a hook height of 140 meters to stack the 120 meters rocket. It's unclear when Super Heavy will roll to the launch pad for testing, but it's safe to say that SpaceX probably won't wait long after Starship SN11's test flight. Just like Mr. Musk mentioned two weeks ago, High Bay got an elevator on its side last week. Recently someone shared a video on Snapchat showing the inside of SpaceX's High Bay top floor and the newly installed elevator. When asked about the proposed 360-degree glass star bar atop the High Bay, Musk replied that, the floor is installed, the elevator is operational, and they are waiting for the installation of the glass base. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.